Friends of the Columbia Gorge's webinar, Wings Over the Columbia Gorge. We are thrilled to start off the new year with a webinar focusing on our iconic national bird, the bald eagle. Thank you all so much for attending this evening as we soar into the world of bald and golden eagles with three experts in the field. While you're getting settled and we wait for a few more to join us, I wanted to go over some Zoom housekeeping before we get started. If you're new to Zoom webinars, I'm going to run through a few things to quickly familiarize you. You'll notice your microphone is muted, and that is because with so many of us here, it's best to give everyone the best chance to hear the speakers without each other's background noise. Your cameras are also turned off so we can pay full attention to the speakers. Throughout this webinar, there are two ways to interact with us, either through the Q&A or the chat box. We will hold all questions until the end of the webinar to ensure we have enough time to get through everything. After the last speaker, we'll go straight into Q&A for about 15 to 20 minutes facilitated by me. If you have a question for speakers, please type it into the Q&A box tool on the bottom of your computer, tablet, or phone screen. If you're using a tablet or phone, the toolbar will likely be at the bottom of the Zoom window on your screen, but it may also be on the top depending on your device. If you don't see the toolbar, try moving your mouse towards the bottom of the screen or touch your screen and it should come up. We will do our best with the limited time we have to get through all of your questions at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the video will be uploaded to Friends YouTube channel tomorrow. If you want to go back and watch some of our previous gorgeous wildlife webinars or enjoy this presentation so much you want to go back and watch again later or share with your friends, then please check out the webinar playlist at gorgefriends.org slash webinars. While you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on our latest videos. All right, so that wraps up the Zoom housekeeping. Again, I want to thank you for joining us tonight as we celebrate eagles and the gorge and learn about their natural history and threats. Just over 50 years ago, the bald eagle was endangered, dwindling down to just 417 pairs in the wild. But after many protections were placed, bald eagles now have steady populations. In the gorge, several hundred can be seen every year this month as they migrate down south in search of food. My name is Kenzie Hammond and I'm your host for tonight. I am the Youth and Community Education Specialist here at Friends of Columbia Gorge. Our presenters for the night are Morgan Olson, Dr. Sean Smallwood, and Hannah Donnell. Tonight, we will take a deep dive into eagles' natural history with Morgan, learn about how wind turbines negatively affect golden and bald eagles with Sean, and finally, finish the night learning about the negative impacts of lead bullets with Hannah. Our first speaker will be Morgan Olson, the Columbia Gorge Discovery Center's Raptor Education Coordinator. She oversees the day-to-day -day care of their six educational birds, including two bald eagles, and has a wealth of knowledge of all things raptors. Morgan educates about the importance of raptors and what these birds can teach us about our environment. Our second speaker is Dr. Sean Smallwood, who has a PhD in ecology from University of California, Davis. For over two decades, he has performed research on bird and bat collision mortality with wind turbines, bird fatalities caused by electrocution and line strikes, and collision mortality at utility scale solar projects. Most of his research and consulting has been directed towards reducing or minimizing problems arising between wildlife and human activities. Our final speaker for the evening is Hannah Donnell, the Oregon Zoo's non-lead hunting educator. After graduating in 2019, she worked as a field biologist for various government agencies and universities. Hannah started with the Oregon Zoo in July of 2022. She recently completed her first successful big game hunting season and is looking forward to future seasons educating hunters. Before I pass the virtual microphone over to Morgan, I wanted to talk a little bit about Friends if you are new to our events. Friends of the Columbia Gorge is the only conservation group entirely dedicated to protecting, preserving, and stewarding the gorge. Friends led the fight to protect the gorge by helping create the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area over 40 years ago and has been working ever since to safeguard the gorge and make sure the natural wonders found today will be preserved for future generations to come. Friends is entirely dedicated to protecting and enhancing the scenic, natural, cultural, and recreational resources in the gorge. And now, Morgan, please take it away for our first presentation of the night. Thank you, Kenzie. Thank you, Kenzie. So, as it was said, my name is Morgan Olson. I work at the Columbia Gorge Discovery Center located in the Dalles, Oregon, where I help take care of two bald eagles in addition to some other raptors. Uh, a little bit about myself. 
I have been working at the Discovery Center in a professional capacity since 2018. Uh, I have a degree in fisheries and wildlife sciences from Oregon State University, go beeves and all that. I'm also a member of our professional organization, I8, the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators, and by some, I am known simply as Bird Lady. But I do want to clarify that I am not a falconer and I am not employed by the federal or state governments. I operate under what's called an education license. I have these birds in my care, not for me, but as part of a collective trust for the sake of everyone here in the United States as a part of a very wonderful piece of legislation known as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. Here's the logo for the Discovery Center. Uh, the Discovery Center was open to the public in 1998 as part of a coalition of multiple organizations. The Discovery Center itself focuses on the natural history as well as those who were here before the Western settlers showed up. So in addition to Native American peoples, we do touch on a little bit about the many early groups that can be found out here, as well as the historical presence of different animals, such as dire wolves and short-nosed bears. Beyond that, the Discovery Center also includes the Wasco County Museum, and it was originally done in partnership as well with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the U.S. Forestry Service. Uh, we are the official interpreter center for the Columbia River Gorge, and we are not to be confused with the interpretive center for the Columbia River Gorge. That is a completely different museum over in Stevenson. Raptors are the reason I am here. And here you can see two of our raptors, our lovely bald eagles, Liberty and Ferguson in their enclosure. Our raptor program was originally established in 2007, but it was in 2008 that it was finally permitted. Uh, it was done with the assistance of local rehabilitators and local raptor educators to create a dedicated place within the gorge for raptor-based education. There are other places in Oregon, and there are some fantastic other places in Oregon where you can meet and see raptors. But in terms of animals living in cap cap captivity and an educational program, we're the only one that you'll find between the Blue Mountain region and Portland. Some more pictures of our bald eagles being themselves, as you see in the photo on the left side, one of them is standing on quite a slender tree up there. They have opportunities to move around in their enclosure. They're not tethered down. They don't wear any falconry equipment because these are not glove birds. They are display birds only. But why would we even have birds like this with us? Why do we not simply let them fly free and live their lives in the wild? Well, the answer is quite simply, they're both pretty severely injured. Our smaller male is our bald eagle, Ferguson, and he was pulled out of the Columbia River in May 2007. According to my records, it was roughly beneath the Hood River White Salmon Bridge. At this point in time, we consider him to be at least 21 years old as he was found back in 2007 with his adult plumage fully grown in the white head feathers and the white tail feathers. He had been pulled out of the water. He had a fracture out in his flanges as well as a gangrene infection, emaciation, and the gangrene infection had progressed to the point of turning necrotic. While the veterinarian was able to help Ferguson recover from a number of his issues, antibiotics, always, always great to have. Unfortunately, necrotic tissue is a bit too far from what 
could be fixed. And so he became a wingtip amputee. Oftentimes people get a little kick out of his name, a bald eagle named Ferguson, but he is in fact named in honor of Hugh Ferguson, who in his um, donation to help get the raptor program at the Discovery Center established. Our other bald eagle is our lovely lady, Liberty. She was found in Convoy National Wildlife Refuge back in 2013. Uh, Convoy is approximately one hour north of the Dalles over in Washington. Uh, we believe her to be about 15 years old at this point. Her white feathers did seem to have a touch of brown to them that the veterinarian believed to mark her as a younger, not quite adult eagle. In her case, she had fractures in her metacarpal. Uh, the fractures were severe enough and numerous enough that they could not be reset back effectively. And we, there were concerns about additional breaks at that site should she be released back into the wild. Bald eagles are some of the largest raptors we have here in North America. Not quite the largest, that goes to the California condor. But while they cruise at speeds of about 14 to 18 miles per hour, they are capable of going into dives in excess of 60 miles per hour. And that's going to be a lot of strain and stress to put on a bone that did not properly heal. So in the case of both of these birds, they are what we refer to as wingtip amputees. They've had a portion of their wing amputated to stop further damage to those already severely injured sites. Here you can see some examples of what that amputation looks like. Uh, that is Ferguson on the left-hand side of the screen and Liberty on the right hand. Neither of these birds are happy. And then a little bit of where those bones, those injuries actually are. Here is a drawing of the wing of a bird. Uh, the major bones are easily labeled and they pretty much have the same names as our human bones. There are circles on the diagram that highlight those major joints, such as the wrist joint, the elbow joint, and the shoulder joint. And one last comparison, this is how that would look on a human. Uh, the reason I want to cover this is sometimes when I talk about a raptor's damaged wrist joint, people can often become confused conflating the wrist joint with the ankle joint. Birds are bipeds like us as humans. Both of us walk on our hind limbs. It's just we use our forelimbs to pick up and manipulate objects. They use their forelimbs to fly around the world, mostly. The two birds are housed outside on the grounds at the Discovery Center. Their enclosure is exposed to the elements year round. And they do have a lovely pond in there that proudly we clean every single day to make sure they have fresh water, not only to drink, but to bathe in. These two individuals are very good about keeping clean and it's not long after we feed them to spot them heading down for a quick wash up. We have an eagle camera set up in here as well for remote observation. So if you happen to come down to the Discovery Center, you can view our eagles through that camera in case you didn't happen to be there when we were giving a live tour. In addition, from their enclosure, the bald eagles are able to look out and see any of the wild animals that happen to be roaming through the gorge. This time of year, it's not uncommon to hear the raptors hooting and hollering as they're shouting at the wild bald eagles perched nearby in trees, as well as red-tailed hawks or great horned owls. Raptors are very abundant here in the gorge. When it comes to food, nothing we feed to the eagles is alive. Everything is dead. Oftentimes, everything was thawed out the night before. Their diet primarily consists of fish as well as rat and quail throughout the week. About four days a week, they get fish, and the other three, we try to 
throw in some fun things. In addition to those three standards, we also give them rabbits, the occasional day old chick, and when appropriately sourced, other rodents as well. While we do accept donations of food, it must meet our safety standards. And while it sounds like there'll be another presentation that delves into this more deeply, lead is always a big concern. I'm quite happy to take any rabbits you might want to give us, but I need to know how that animal died. So that way I can be confident when I feed it to my birds, it is safe for them to eat the same way it should be safe for you to eat. As for what their favorite food is, well, found that out this year during that very brief smelt season over on the Sandy. They absolutely adore smelts. They will come right up to me to get their smelt when it's smelt day. Another thing is a whole animal is a whole meal. I try to give them food as intact as I can, but I do like to cut it open and remove the guts ahead of time for one big, big reason. They don't always eat the guts. Oftentimes as humans, when we look at predatory animals, we love them, we adore them. We look at these noble, proud creatures that hunt only to feed themselves. They let nothing go to waste. They eat the whole carcass and they take no more than they need. But that's a very simplified and romanticized version of the way that wild animals live. A wild animal lets nothing go to waste because it might have been a day or two since its last meal. And when it's been a day or two since your last meal, when you're trying to get through the harsh season of winter time, it doesn't matter how old that meat is, you need that energy now. But for our birds that live in captivity that are fed on a daily basis, in this case, the bald eagles get about 200 to 300 grams of food a day during the winter time, maybe a little bit higher when it's a harsher winter when we're getting a lot of ice out there. Right now, it's actually a little bit on the low end with how warm the nights have been. But making sure I'm removing all the bits that they're not going to eat and making sure whatever I give them is safe. As for what things they don't eat, well, they're not big fans of sturgeon. One of the common questions I get is what about cats? Will a bald eagle eat a cat? And, well, we need to think about what a cat is. A cat is a small mammal. It's a carnivorous predator, and it typically weighs about 8 to 12 pounds. In the photograph here, this is my cat. His name is Pipes, and he is currently wearing his little harness, and he's leashed up for a walk outside. And he weighs 16 pounds. He's proportionally, he is a large cat in general. But the question I want you folks to think about for a second is, what's heavier? Is it a bald eagle like Liberty or Ferguson, a full adult bird, or is it Pipes, the house cat? And it's important to think about this because oftentimes people can be quite surprised when they learn how much a bald eagle weighs. There are regional variants. Bald eagles that live in Alaska are bigger and heavier than bald eagles that live in Oregon. On the flip side, bald eagles that live down in Florida and the Gulf Coast are smaller than the Oregonian ones. But when we look at Ferguson and Liberty, Liberty is the female. She's the larger of the two. Liberty clocks in at about 11 pounds. Ferguson weighs about eight to nine pounds. So the average weight of a Oregonian bald eagle is not too far off from the average weight of a house cat. In fact, Pipes is just a hair heavier than an Alaskan female bald eagle, one that might weigh closer to 15 pounds. So does that mean we need to be afraid about bald eagles flying off with our cats? Well, what I like to point out is if you're worried about wildlife injuring your animals, always keep your animals attended to and also be attentive to the damage that your animals can do to the wildlife. While Pipes is an adorable little cuddly thing, 
he is still a vicious predator in his own right. He's tightly attuned for nocturnal and crepuscular predation. He has amazing hearing, amazing eyesight. His whiskers help him explore in tiny places he probably shouldn't be. He has a powerful bite with sharp teeth, his incisors and canines, as well as powerful back feet for jumping, running, raking, and clawing. So do please always keep your pets inside, and if you always feel that it is cruel to them, try and take them for a walk. He likes to eat grass. So when it comes to our perception of wild animals and what they do, we need to remember that as humans, we're going to only be able to see the world as humans based on our own experiences. As humans, we have excellent sight and hearing. We have great endurance. We have strong, robust bodies with powerful skeletons, but we're also sociable creatures. Oftentimes when people see one of our other raptors here at the Discovery Center who lives on their own, I'm asked, is she lonely? Does he wanna be an near another bird? Why do we not pair them up? The answer is for one, our permit doesn't allow us to breed birds in captivity. Raising baby birds is quite an undertaking, but most importantly of all, Raptors are naturally solitary creatures. While they will congregate, especially down here at the gorge during wintertime, if you look out at the Dalles Dam soon, you may spot 10, 15, 20 bald eagles hanging out in the slender, narrow trees. Well, you're not going to see that during the summertime. You might see maybe two bald eagles, and chances are good they're probably related whether it's a male and the female or a parent and an offspring. They're birds that have that bond with each other. But come fall when they get ready to head out on their own, whether it's the Alaskan and the Canadian eagles coming down to Oregon, or it's just one bird looking to lay claim to its own territory, those bald eagles are probably going to prefer to be on their own because any other bald eagles would be Getting into their territory, it would serve as additional competition when they're trying to find enough food to sustain themselves through the year. So while there are more to follow, uh, here are some simple tips for supporting your wild bald eagles. Always pack up what you brought out, whether it's loose pieces of plastic that were wrapped around sandwiches or your soda cans. You had enough room in your car to get it out there. You have enough room to take it back. Use non-lead ammunition when hunting. It's safer for them and safer for yourself. Avoid using poison bait, such as for rat traps. If a bald eagle happens to consume two, three, or five dead rats, it's going to consume that many doses of poison. Keep your pets on leash because bald eagles and dogs are not friends. Always observe wild animals at a distance. Nobody wants to make the national news being the person that got ran down by a large animal at Yellowstone, and yet there always is at least one. And most importantly of all, learn your eagles. The bald eagle is not the only eagle you'll find out here in Oregon. It's not even the only eagle you can find in the Dalles. I have per personally witnessed golden eagles on the edge of town as well. While a adult golden eagle bears a very strong resemblance to a juvenile golden eagle, keep an eye out for field marks. For golden eagle adults, it's a streak of bright, well, of golden feathers on the nape of their necks, as well as note how far down the legs those feathers go. Bald eagles are fishing eagles, and the feathers go all the way down to their ankles, but Golden eagles, as booted eagles, the feathers go down further to where their toes come together. With that said, if you are interested in supporting us over at the Discovery Center, you can do that by becoming a member or renewing a yearly membership. You can also make donations directly to the Raptor Department, either as funds or as things. We always are trying to find new ways to enrich the lives of the birds that we have with us, such as toys or other objects. Our red-tailed hawk is 
getting pretty good at her current puzzle toys, so if you happen to have an old one lying around, I'm interested. You can also join our email list to keep up to date on goings and comings at the Discovery Center, and you can always simply check out our website at gorgediscovery.org. That wraps things up for me. I believe at this point I am passing it off to the good doctor. Hello. Thank you, Morgan. Okay. Whoops. Hi, I'm Sean Smallwood. Uh, before I get going, oh, did, it, did it again. I want to recognize my longtime collaborators, Doug Bell and Lee Nair. Uh, much what I'm going to show you wouldn't have been showable without those guys, their help. And also this eagle I'm showing you right now, uh, this photo was taken right after it Barely missed being killed by a wind turbine. It was so close. I'm going to touch on research related to Altamont Pass, uh, collision mortality, gold, mostly of golden eagles. I'm going to get rid of this. Oh, well. Uh, I'm talking about mostly about golden eagles because that's mostly what we have in the Altamont Pass wind resource area where I've done most of my work. We did. We do have some bald eagles. They started coming in about 2013. They've been increasing in number, but mostly it's golden eagles in the Altamont Pass. I'm going to talk about fatality estimation, counts of abundance, otherwise known as use rates, behavior patterns, GPS telemetry tracking, breeding, and the list goes on. Most of these findings are generally applicable elsewhere, including the gorge. In fact, a lot of our eagles uh, we know go to the gorge. The history of the Altamont, uh, more than 7,000 turbines were built in the Altamont Pass. These were called first generation turbines. That's how we refer to them. They started in the 1980s. There were some, this first study was started in 1989. That was Orloff and Flannery. Um, my study and her study um, caused quite a bit of controversy. Mine ended up with uh, some lawsuits um, with a settlement uh, agreement of a 50% raptor mortal mortality reduction goal. Um, the Avian Protection Program was also started because of that in 2005. Uh, at the same time, they started uh, restarted fatality searches, and they they seated the Scientific Review Committee, otherwise known as the SRC. I was a member of that committee. <clears throat> the SRC made some prior recommendations in 2007. One was to repower as soon as possible, but that didn't start until 2011. Another was to remove hazardous turbines, which was effective, but delayed and too few were removed to make much of a difference. We recommended, recommended a four month winter shutdown, but it turned to be the wrong time of year for golden eagles. They're most abundant in the winter, but they're, um, that's not when they get killed by turbines. And we recommended removal of vacant towers. These are towers with no turbines on them, sort of junk. And those are delayed and very few were removed ever. The post-construction mortality reduction measures proved to be difficult due to arguments over efficacy and cost. We spent a lot of time deliberating them, but not really solving the problem or getting anywhere. In 2010, NextEra agreed with the California Attorney General and Audubon to repower the turbines in three phases, mitigating their projects by funding research in support of map-based collision hazard models. I thought at that time that I had, you know, the SRT had done, gone it's useful to have met us down and I just needed to uh, do something else. So I, I resigned from the SRC and took up the research money to help with the repowering by developing collision hazard models to guide the siding. <clears throat> we needed fatality estimates and we've been getting that from the Altamont Pass for a long time. To get these, we have to adjust the number of fatalities we find by the number we think we didn't find. And to get that number, we place carcasses in detecting trials and see how many of the, the uh, searchers miss. Um, we estimated about, well, before repowering, we estimated about 55 fatalities per year um, as eagles. 
But these these estimates were biased and low for two main reasons. So one was the uh, insufficient search radius. So this eagle I'm sitting or crouching next to here, my colleague and I, and I we found this eagle plus another one. It's only a few meters away. But both these eagles were 15 meters beyond the search radius, and the searchers had not found these eagles. So if they don't find it, they don't get counted. So there's a search radius bias. Another bias is one I call crippling bias, and that's the number of eagles that are mortally injured. Um, but they leave the area to die somewhere else, and there's no evidence left behind of their injury. As I said, the bald eagles started coming in about 2013. These are juveniles. Um, the one on the right, I photographed after, right after uh, it ate a cotton ate a ground squirrel. And um, right where I took this photograph, three days later, here it is, killed by a wind turbine. As far as I know, it's the first documented case of a bald eagle being killed by a U.S. wind turbine. Since then, I'm aware of two more that have been killed. There's other hatches that come with wind projects, including uh, the generation tie-ins. This eagle here, by the way, is carrying one of our telemetry units. Barely survived. They also are uh, hazarded by meteorological towers, otherwise known as MET towers. Um, a lot of the times the towers, the, the guide wires are not marked. The eagle I'm holding on the right was um, under a MET tower with a broken wing and had been there for a long time because it was emaciated and it being euthanized. Uh, there's been various types of mitigation tried. I've tried to uh, monitor the efficacy of the, each one to the best I can. I can. Uh, this is contrast painting. Uh, it was introduced, I think in 2006 or maybe 2007, not uh, 2006. Or even 2000, no, it's somewhere around 2006. Anyway, it's a black, it's, it's a painting of one blade black and two white, it's supposed to help the raptor see the, uh, the turbines. There's been other various desperate measures to try, try like an air dancer, disco balls, alternate perches, netting wrapped around the tower. And one company hired a guy to drive around in his truck and haze eagles. He would, when he saw one, he would jump out of his truck and wave his arms. All these measures met the same fate as this air dancer. Didn't take long. Another popular mitigation measure is poisoning the squirrels with the idea that if you get rid of the squirrels, the eagles won't come anymore. Um, this was begun by the wind companies 25 years ago or so. It was discovered by the regulation regulator, regulators, the companies had to stop, but some of the ranchers kept doing it. They make revenue. Um, I can't say for exactly why they're doing it, but they're, I, I suspect they're doing it because they make revenue from the wind companies and they're helping out. Another uh, measure has been detect and curtail, this, this one being uh, identiflight. Uh, this um, technology detects an approaching eagle and instructs the wind turbine or two or three wind turbines to shut down temporarily until the threat is gone. This implementation, which happened a few years ago, has suffered a lot of technical difficulties. Um, the study design, in my opinion, was inadequate, and the efficacy of the measure remains uncertain. Personally, I don't think it works. It would be great if it did, but I don't think it's. I think it's, the problem is too complicated for technology to solve on the whole. Repower has been offering some interesting opportunities for testing hypotheses as turbines are removed and others are added, so I can test the effects of tower height blade size, et cetera, et cetera. The turbines on the, the bonus turbines you see there on the left, those are um, first generation turbines before they're removed. And then one megawatt turbines on the right are intermediate uh, or some of the earliest uh, repowered turbines. And the 2.3 megawatt turbine is more typical of what's being done these days. In fact, the turbines are getting bigger. They're getting up to three and four and five megawatts. Repowering reduces the number of wind turbines. It opens up available airspace to flying birds. It can underground the electrical cables, um, which gets rid of another threat. And it's an opportunity to more carefully site the, the uh, new wind turbines to avoid hazardous terrain and wind settings. Going into the models that developed uh, for this hazardous, um, well, this microsiding was included in use rates, otherwise known as uh, relative abundance. We did uh, almost 8,000 hours worth of surveys, which uh, spanned 30 years in the Ultima Pass. They, uh, the sessions varied from 10 to 60 minutes, and the survey boundaries varied, ranged from 300 meters to almost 1,000 meters. 
these latter two attributes, uh, you have to be careful. I mean, they're, they're, they introduce biases. And so we have to be careful, have to be savvy of how the biases work. And these, but these graphs are supposed to show you that, but I, I can't, don't really have time to go into them, but um, you get different uh, utility, um, use rates uh, based on, you know, different uh, sur survey boundaries and different um, um, survey session. The map on the right shows the various uh, uh, use rate stations we used in the Altamont. Here's how the use data are used and some uh, is partly how, how they're used. The top graph shows um, use rates by study and the bottom graph shows use rates aggregated by month and it reveals a interannual cycle. Also use data, data are also useful for um, uh, showing us the uh, seasonal trend in Golden Eagle use in the Altamont. That's the bottom right graph. Um, use rates, average use rates are concentrated highest in the middle of the Altamont Pass. That's the red and yellow, orange dots here. Um, but there's a lot of interannual shifting of patterns of use in the Altamont. So it's hard to predict from one year to the next how many eagles are going to be where. This reason and probably other reasons, use rates poorly predict collision mortality, whether they're measured from visual scan, um, surveys or GPS telemetry. Nor did the US Fish and Wildlife Service model work. There was not predictive in the Altamont Pass. Not even when the data were collected from, um, the use data were collected from the same locations and same time periods when the mortality data were collected. You would think it would work there in that circumstance, but it did not. Behaviors on the other hand are stable in the responses to terrain and wind, to other eagles, other birds. Models based on behaviors are accurate and more generalizable from place to place. Here's how the behavior data are collected. Um, we just put point data on a map. For each point, we attribute by the bird, which is the letter, and the sequence, which is the number. And we record the time in the survey, each point is uh, observed, um, the species, the height, behavior, interaction with other, another bird, if there was one, and a hazard event with a turbine or any other infrastructure if there was such an event. We digitize these points, connect them for uh, flight lines, and they go, uh, they're analyzed in GIS. Here's some of the data, use data, um, expresses activity by the hour of the day and by the month. And you can see that the visual scan survey data were similar to the GPS telemetry data, which I find to be interesting. But there are some qualitative differences. There's advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages to each type of data collection. For example, with telemetry, you get a lot of data from fewer number of individuals. The visual scan data, you sample from a lot more eagles, although you get fewer data. Also, the visual scan data, you see what the eagles are actually doing, whereas with the telemetry data, you get some general activity patterns, such as flying or perching, but not much else. Here's some data or patterns from the visual scan uh, behavior data. On the top is flight minutes per hour, and the bottom is collision hazard events per hour. You can see the eagles are responding to temperature, to wind speed in the middle graphs, and to uh, wind direction. So the collision hazard events are most common when the temperature temperature's kind of cool and when the wind speeds are high and coming from the north or southwest or south. This is one of my favorite graphs in the behavior data because it shows that, you know, well, it shows to me it's actionable. And what this shows is that uh, golden eagles are more likely to get into trouble uh, with a wind turbine before 8 a.m. than after 4 p.m. And it's a ninefold difference. So it's a big difference. So if we're going to pursue a curtailment strategy, it makes sense to me to curtail wind turbine uh, operations in the early morning. I witnessed, and my colleagues and I witnessed, over 2,000 flights of Golden Eagles during all these behavior surveys, 233 collision hazard events. Amazingly, 1.77% of the flights passed through um, a, a turbine rotor. We recorded 74 near misses, um, recorded the circumstances of hazard events. So most, of the, uh, they, most of the recorded uh, circumstances included other eagles or other birds where there's a distraction involved. Um, 
four of them were uh, involved distraction by the observer, and that's interesting. And none of the collision hazard events involved eagles attacking squirrels, which is significant because you hear about that as a hypothesis in the scientific literature oftentimes and in the news media that eagles get in trouble because they're going after squirrels, but I never saw it. <clears throat> the map on the right shows the number of adult flight lines intercepting grid cells, either 10 meter grid cells in Alto Pass. And the point of this is to reveal flight patterns from the GPS telemetry. And what you see is that the eagles follow the canyons. Um, there's a pretty distinct patterns. These are adult eagles in this map. And I also want to point out that this map differs from the map for subadults and for juveniles. So these three age classes, which are fairly broad, they are they're partitioning the space in the Altamont Pass. There's a lot of overlap, but they're also partitioning the space. What I also found is that um, you know there's there's a lot of value in the um, integration of GPS telemetry data with visual scan data. And that's what I'm going to go later in this talk. But first, I also map prey base and counter squirrels. And here the green dots are squirrels and the red are pocket gophers. Um, I had a lot of them in this part of the Ultima Pass. It's called the Vesco Caves Regional Preserve. In 2006, it was covered squirrels. By 2018, they were largely gone because we replaced cattle as a grazer with sheep. We did it deliberately because we were interested in looking for uh, another means to discourage eagles if that was a viable option. Um, so we got rid of, we pretty much got rid of the squirrels. I kind of regret that now, but um, we did, we were able to test the hypothesis is very important. We found that ground squirrels are most abundant lower on the slopes, low elevation, whereas pocket gophers are more abundant higher on the slopes, higher elevation. This is significant because, you know, lower the slope is not where the turbines are. So the ground squirrels are mostly living away from the turbines. In fact, that's how the eagles hunt for them. They typically contour hunt for ground squirrels, trying to catch one that's too far from a burrow to get back in time. And that's not gonna be the squirrel, he's, he's safe. But this squirrel didn't make it. He was too far away and he got caught. There's nowhere near a turban. So what happened after we, took, you know, we reduced the squirrel population in Vasco Caves? Uh, the eagles kept going there. Uh, There's no significant difference, which the graph on the right shows. Um, in fact, I would argue that um, there's increased in squirrel at, at golden eagle activity. So they're going, to, they're, they're using the environment and the Altima for reasons other than just squirrels and for predation. I tested for a relationship and with using all kinds of data, including these GPS telemetry data. I tried at different scales, different spatial grains. I tried with the visual scan data, and I could never find a um, significant relationship between relationship between golden eagle activity and squirrel abundance. Ah, let's go back. What's more influential is eagle location activities are the locations and demographic status of other eagles in the area. What I found is the eagles are always scanning for other eagles. Here on the left, we have um, some courtship display and the two two photos, um, the one stooping while the other watches. And you know it's right next to an operative turbine where the blades are moving, very dangerous. On the right, you have a, an adult male on the bottom uh, chasing this juvenile out of its breeding territory. And these, these interactions can be very aggressive, although I never saw an adult eagle actually harm a juvenile. But all around this interaction that I'm showing you in this photo, I mean, there are like four or five big wind turbines surrounding this, this uh, scene. A lot of the interactions are quite aggressive, impressive, but I never saw an eagle hurt another one. I'm sure it does happen, but I didn't see it. And it could be really dangerous though when they do this around wind turbines. So I wanna know where this is happening. Where are these interactions happening on the landscape so I can model that and try to recommend turbine sighting away from those places. Here we have eagles in play. And I saw this over and over in the Ultima Pass. One eagle carries a cow pat. The other tries to dislodge the cow pat from the carrier. At some point, the carrier will drop the cow pat and the chaser will then try to catch the cow pat before it hits the ground. Never happens. And then they care, they, the chaser will carefully find the right cow pat on the ground, pick it up and become the carrier and the other one chases. And this goes on back and forth sometimes near turbines. This eagle tried to get a common raven to engage in that kind of play, but the common raven seemed confused and just watched the eagle. So it, the eagle started playing with itself and you know dropping a cow pat from height and then trying to catch it before it hit the ground. 
This one on the left was carrying a very unusually large cow pad. And I watched it for a long time, playing with this cow pad, dropping it, trying to catch it. And it kept going to Turban 15 in Golden Hills. And uh, every time I did that, I held my breath. I had to go check on a Berwin owl. Um, I was gone, gone only a few minutes. I came back and this poor bird was cut in half under Turban 15. So to make these collision hazard models, Lee Nair, my GIS analyst, he start off by dividing the landscape up into ridges and valley bottoms, which you see here. He has blue lines and gold lines. And he overlaid a grid and measured terrain measurements, a whole bunch of them. And we built spatially explicit collision hazard models from the data representing fatalities and risky behaviors. We call these events. And we related, we, uh, related the events to where these terrain measures were made. And we, uh, ex we implemented a class of models called fuzzy logic models. Here's one of those models based only on fatalities, golden eagle fatalities. The red is the highest hazard and the light green is the lowest hazard. Here's a model based on fatalities, use rates, behavior, telemetry and telemetry patterns. <clears throat> Again, showing your work. You know, we would use this kind of a map to recommend where the turbine should go and should not go. Here's how it, uh, it turned out at the first such project where we implement this kind of model. This is Vasco Winds. The data on the left are before repowering. The data on the right are after report repowering. The red is uh, Vasco Winds uh, mortality, and the blue is other turbines in, in nearby. And we achieved an 80% fatality reduction, reduction of golden eagles, which is not too bad. But I learned things along the way, like and that first project and subsequent projects, I learned that grading can have an impact too. So it became popular for the companies to grade berms and to put the turbines, enable the turbine to be located near these excavated um, cubbies or pockets in the, in the landscape. The advantage for the company was that the rotor would then be right upwind of slope deflected wind. So you get a passive increase in the energy, the power that the, the turbine can generate. Trouble with this is it creates a lot of turbulence and any bird or bat coming through here is gonna be surprised by a rotor plane all of a sudden as it crests this little berm. So these kinds of turbines where this kind of excavation took place killed a lot of birds and bats, including eagles. So I went to making a new model, um, a composite model. And I started you know, using what I learned from the GIS based models and going towards more towards uh, rating, uh, subjective rating. I've been doing that all the time anyway. And I was always comparing my ratings to the model predictions to, so I can improve my skill at judging which places, which settings are more dangerous than others for each kind of animal. Here is a graph showing the performance of the model, the composite model. And what it shows that the, it's, the performance is fantastic. So the validation data actually performed better than the source data. The validation data are eagles that were killed after I developed the model. So it did not contribute to the model. Okay, so there's a lot of models here, uh, equations. I'm gonna pass through this real quick. I just wanna point out there's a method for what I'm, I'm gonna show you next. There was a method for using the telemetry data and the digital scan data to come up with a number of eagles in the Altamont Pass. So at any given time, there's an average of about 70, 72 golden eagles in the Altamont Pass. Uh, there were 309 visitors annually to the Altamont Pass, they come and go. 15.5% of the annual visitors were killed by wind turbines during the last part of the study, but not counting this one. This one was struck by Golden Hills Turbine 11 while in a courtship, which I was watching. This eagle left no evidence of a fatal collision with the search area, within the search area. It actually uh, did a crash landing about 200 meters from the turbine. I collected it and took it to a hospital where it was euthanized because it didn't have a chance. So I went to estimate this. And the way I did it, you know, this crippling bias, because we didn't have no means previously to estimate crippling bias, which I always suspected was huge. What I did is I introduced photography using a long lens. And starting in 2012, I started photographing every eagle I saw at the Altamont Pass. And I integrated my photographs with the telemetry, with the visual scan data, and I, um, never mind, there's a lot of details here. I'm gonna cut to the quick. <clears throat> Before I do, though, I want to point out this eagle was in, uh, injured two weeks after his fit fight by a telemetry uh, backpack. It lived for 18 months, mostly foraging by ground hopping for prey items, but it couldn't get left. Um, it was harassed incessantly by other eagles, red tail hawks, and other birds, and eventually, after 18 months, died of starvation and fungal infection. This is what I mean by crippling bias. This bird was out there, it hung out with a male, 
for a while, but it never bred. It should have, but it was injured. And um, it was just hard to watch. We actually did try to catch this bird several times, but uh, we failed. Anyway, I took a lot of photo series of eagles. 30 of them involved golden eagles with major injuries, major visible injuries. So using the math I showed you before, very quickly, I didn't really show you, but I just kind of blew through it. But um, my estimate is that 55.6 golden eagles per year sustain visible injuries in the Altamont. And that translates to a, a mortality rate of 77.5 eagles per year. 25% of the annual visitors are killed or maimed. Here's the big picture result. Um, we have a 45% decline over the last decade of my work in the Altamont Pass. 45% decline of Altamont, uh, eagles, golden eagles. Weems and Kolar and their study of um, occupancy and breeding in the Altamont Pass, they found that um, there's an order of magnitude difference between um, the occurrence of subadults as pair members within the Altamont Pass versus outside the Altamont Pass. This is indicative of high adult mortality. It's not good for eagles. And to conclude, golden eagles are declining, declining the ultimate pass. It's not sustainable. Careful siding based on science can minimize impacts, but too many wind projects around the country have already been, uh, been built and they pose large risk to eagles right now. Terrain settings are favored by wind comp companies that are oftentimes the same terrain set settings uh, favored by eagles because they're wind adapted species. The gradient to increase energy generation adds risk to golden eagles and other wildlife. We need to take the macro siding seriously. In other words, project decisions need to be taken more seriously. Should the project go there or not? Is it worth it? And we need regulatory enforcement. And with that, I'll turn it over to Hannah. Let's see. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. All right. My name is Hannah Donnell and I work for the non-lead hunting education program. We are based out of the Oregon Zoo and funded through uh, the Oregon Zoo and ODFW. I'm just gonna talk to you today a little bit about some of the issues facing uh, bald eagles when it comes to lead bullets. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about lead exposure today. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on how lead exposure works. Uh, I have a human body up here because people have actually been talking about lead exposure and humans as far back as ancient Greece. This is gonna be one of the few instances where we can actually use research done on humans to talk about other animals. So most of the time when people are exposed to lead, it's because they consumed it. So after it's consumed, it circulates in the blood where it stays for one to three weeks. I'm gonna talk a little bit about blood lead levels later on. And that's because it's a really easy way to get a recent snapshot of that recent lead exposure. So after it circulates in the blood, it will enter the soft tissue and organs where it stays for several months and then it goes into uh, the bones where it replaces calcium and it does remain there for life. So lead exposure can cause a whole host of issues. Um, it can cause behavioral issues, uh, decreased IQ, motor skills issues, and in large amounts, it can cause death. Uh, this is particularly problematic in developing vertebrate systems. So that's gonna be kids and young wildlife. Um, and a lot of these things are difficult to test in wildlife because you know they're sublethal impacts and uh, you can't give an eagle an IQ test. There have been some studies though that have looked at blood lead levels and uh, eagles in terms of their movement. So they find that uh, with increased amounts of lead in the eagle's blood, they fly uh, lower and they do not move as much per day. So when we talk about actual uh, lead exposure rates across the country, a study came out in 2000 uh, or in 2022, looking at um, kind of estimating those, those nationwide lead exposure levels. So they looked at uh, bald eagle lead exposure in 38 states in live and dead eagles. And they found that uh, from their model, 47% of bald eagles nationwide were showing signs of chronic lead poisoning. And those were similar numbers for golden eagles. When it comes to actual organ numbers, I don't have those specific numbers. Uh, a study hasn't really been done looking just at Oregon, let alone in the uh, Columbia Gorge. But a study came out in 2010 looking at Pacific Northwest bald eagle lead exposure rates. Um, the study looked at bald and golden eagles submitted uh, or admitted, excuse me, to the Washington State University Raptor Rehabilitation Program. And they found that 48% of bald eagles admitted had uh, toxic lead levels. And again, similar numbers for golden eagles. So that map up there is gonna show where the eagles were uh, found 
the circles are bald eagles and the triangles are golden eagles. And then the number next to those shapes is gonna be the month they were admitted. So this study also found that 91% of those uh, bald eagles admitted were uh, sent into the program after the general hunting season. So what's that connection between uh, hunting and lead exposure in eagles? That comes down to the material, whoops, sorry, uh, the material that bullets are made out of. So bullets have been, um, bullets are traditionally made out of lead and people have been using lead bullets for hundreds of years for from everything from uh, hunting to target shooting to warfare. Um, and lead is a really useful metal for this because it is a pretty ductile metal, right? In order for a bullet to actually work and create a, a good, a good amount of damage in a wound channel, it needs to be able to expand. So it needs to be able to fly through the air in an aerodynamic shape, but then at the point of impact, it has to become bigger, right? It has to expand to actually create damage in a wound channel. So lead does that because it's a soft metal. So it actually changes the shape of the bullet. The downside of this is that you see on the screen here, uh, little pieces of lead will come off the bullet as it's moving through, uh, say your animal, um, as it's moving through the animal at those, those high speeds. And it's because lead is a, again, a pretty soft metal. So people have always known that weight retention is an issue with lead bullets, but they didn't realize uh, the extent of the issue until about 20 or 30 years ago. Again, people have been using these bullets for hundreds of years. Um, but about in the 80s, a company called Barnes started developing a bullet made out of copper, and they did this to try and increase the weight retention of bullets. It actually wasn't designed as a, a green bullet or anything like that. It was just designed to address an issue of weight retention. So copper bullets work uh, a little bit differently, but they still need to expand in order to create that damage. So the copper bullet is gonna be the one on the right there with that blue tip. It has a hollow point right underneath the blue tip. So at the point of impact, fluid is gonna fill that hollow point and cause the petals to kind of peel back into that nice mushroom shape that you see uh, right to the right of that bullet. So uh, yeah, again, I guess I should have started with this just in case uh, the bullets on the on the left are gonna be the unfired bullets and then the, the mushroom shape lying next to it are the, the fired bullets. So what does this actually look like? Well, when people uh, go out hunting, they actually don't take the full animal out of the field with them. So there's a lot of rules around what, type, what meat you need to take out of the field with you uh, to prevent any sort of wanton waste. But most people leave the internal organs of the animal they just shot in the field. Um, there's, there's a lot of different reasons for this, but a lot of people just don't have the resources or knowledge to use those organs. So that means that like the, the heart and the lungs that folks just shot through with their bullet, they're gonna actually cut that out of the animal and leave that in the field. This has also been seen as a big benefit in the past. Um, there have been a lot of studies done about how useful that food source is for scavengers. So just to kind of drive home what this is gonna look like, um, I've got some ballistic gels up on the screen here. The one on top is, uh, Ballistic gels are also just kind of a material that kind of simulates uh, flesh. So people shoot into it to get an idea of how effective the bullet is gonna be. Um, so you've got a ballistic gel with a lead bullet shot into it on top and then a ballistic gel with a non-lead shot on the bottom. And these are x-rays of these ballistic gels. So the white uh, pieces that you see in the gel on top, those are all gonna be lead. So that's kind of what's happening to those internal organs as the bullet goes through it. And then folks uh, are field dressing their animals and cutting out those internal organs and leaving them in the field. Again, uh, this in the past has been seen as a great food source for scavengers, but now we know that this is having some unintended impacts on those same animals. And this is a video, I'm cheating a little bit. These are golden eagles, but uh, this is a video taken of these eagles scavenging on an elk carcass out in Eastern Oregon. So this is what, you know, this actually looks like in person. And uh, on this particular game camera, I mean, these, this is just uh, some eagles, but, you know, black bears came to this, foxes, ravens, crows, all sorts of animals will uh, scavenge on a single carcass. So one thing that you really find out in this work is that um, the hunting conservation community and the non-hunting conservation community end up having pretty similar goals, right? Everyone wants to maintain wildlife and habitat for future generations. We all want our children and our children's children to have the same uh, experiences that we had. Um, so the hunting conservation community in general, uh, is, um, extremely uh, conservation minded. There's a lot of habitat restoration projects that uh, folks carry out to try and um, continue maintaining this habitat. I wasn't even familiar with Friends of the Gorge before this presentation, but from reading up on some of the work you all do, I know that that's a very, uh, 
similar concept that I'm sure we can all agree on. And as someone who loves trail running in the gorge, I have to say uh, thank you for all the conservation work. So at this point, some people are probably thinking, we've got an alternative to lead bullets. We know those work. Lead seems to have a lot of issues. Let's just ban it. That is a great thought. Uh, but we can look to California as a case study for um, a lead ban and what kind of happens there. So California actually has banned the use of lead ammunition. They were the, they're the only state where that is currently outlawed. But that was done because uh, of the California condor, which is, um, you can see on the, the picture of on the screen there. Uh, California condor numbers ended up uh, very low in the 80s and they started being reintroduced in the 90s. And then um, they were finding out that the leading cause of mortality for condors was lead exposure and lead poisoning. So taking this in mind, uh, in 2007, Governor Schwarzenegger signed a bill that banned the use of lead ammunition in areas of the state that were inhabited by condors. This sounds great, but animals don't really tend to stay in one area. Condors in particular have a huge home range. Uh, they can glide uh, very efficiently and move very far. So in 2013, uh, the ban wasn't working. So in 2013, they actually ended up banning lead ammunition in the uh, full state and that went into effect in 2019. However, as of 2002, lead poisoning is still the leading cause of mortality for condors in California. And we don't specifically know why. There haven't been any studies or a lot of research looking at exactly why this lead ban isn't working. What we do know, uh, lead ammunition is still sold in stores. A lot of ammunition is sold to uh, target shooters and lead ammunition is only banned for hunting. So we know it's still available. We know that it's a very difficult law to actually enforce. Lead and copper bullets look very similar from uh, just an eyesight test. And we also know that uh, this, this ban wasn't brought forward by hunters, right? It's actually uh, really promoted and, and pushed through more or less by groups that have traditionally been very anti-hunting. So this ended up creating a, a real um, loss of goodwill between non-lead ammunition and the hunting community, as well as the shooting industry. So at this point, there is nothing that would suggest that a lead ban would have any positive effects. However, the hunting community, like I touched on earlier, has a extremely long history of conservation. And so one thing that we try to do with this program is connect this new information with people's core values. Uh, hunters in general have a real core value of conservation, and we can see that over the last hundred years, right? We see a big shift away from the market hunting of the 1800s into a regulated, well-managed, uh, well-regulated kind of conservation philosophy and ethic. And most hunters are extremely proud of that. They will quote Teddy Roosevelt or hold Aldo Leopold in really high esteem. So one thing that we can do is take this new information about lead ammunition and its unintended impacts and connect it with those core values because you can't change people's core values, right? Psychologically, that's just not how it works. But we take this new information, connect it with those core values and show how it benefits them as an individual, the hunting community and the, the wildlife that we're all trying to protect for future generations um, by showing them how you know, we can continue to be good stewards of the environment. And when it comes to why we hunt at all in the first place, you know, most people aren't subsisting off of the game meat that they hunt anymore. That's just not quite how our society works. However, for those of you who don't know, uh, the majority of conservation projects from state agencies are funded by the Wildlife and Sport Fish and Restoration Act. So this is also known as the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. This act essentially took an existing excise tax on ammunition, guns and uh, archery equipment, or excuse me, on the sale of that, and put it aside into um, kind of a fund that is uh, regulated and doled out by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to state agencies every year. So this is a big deal, right? This is a uh, consistent, stable source of funding that if, if anyone follows um, the political news these days, you know, you can't take that for granted at all. Uh, it's no saying that, uh, this kind of funding would be available today. So just last year alone, over $1.6 billion were given to states for uh, the fiscal year. And this goes to conservation projects, habitat restoration projects, um, diversity projects. This is the majority of the funding that state agencies run off of. For Oregon, that was $37.7 million. So just to wrap up here, I'm gonna touch on how this can actually 
work this uh, collaboration between the hunting and the non-hunting community to really uh, benefit wildlife for the long term. So this study was done in 2012 in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, actually in the uh, Grand Teton, part of the Grand Teton Park and uh, the Jackson Hole National Elk Refuge. So this is important because there's only one general uh, big game season here. There's no varmint hunting or predator hunting or upland hunting because the national park, it's just that one big game elk season in the fall. So researchers looked at the blood lead levels in bald eagles in this area and they started with testing nestlings. So nestlings uh, are born in the spring, right? They're eating anything their parents bring to them. So anything that's out on the landscape, they're gonna be consuming. So they found nestlings to have uh, lead levels consistent with background lead levels. And this makes sense, right? There's uh, some legacy lead out in the environment. Uh, we used to put lead in everything like gasoline power plants. So there's a little bit out there as is, but you're not seeing these high lead levels in the nestlings. However, when they started testing non-nestlings, so anything flying around and feeding itself, you start seeing those higher rates of lead exposure in, that go into the clinical and the acute exposure range, ranges. They then broke these numbers down by the non-hunting and the hunting season, and they found that they just were not seeing these high levels of lead exposure outside of the hunting season. So what do we do with this? Well, all the guys who did this uh, study are actually hunters. They were wondering how can we make hunting stronger while also decreasing the amount of lead exposure to bald eagles in this area. So in 2009 and 2010, they actually started issuing free and discounted non-lead ammunition to anyone who drew a tag in the Jackson Hole region. So this had the effect of increasing overall harvest, but still decreasing the amount of uh, lead exposure in those eagles and the amount of lead ammunition used. So this is a real win for conservation, right? This is a way that we can keep hunting strong, keep those dollars going to conservation while also decreasing the amount of lead on the landscape. So we try to do similar things here in Oregon with our program. We, uh, we have an incentive program where if folks show us they buy a box of non-lead ammunition, we'll enter them to win hunting gear. So we have 10 prizes for experienced hunters and 10 for new hunters. The first prize for, for each new and experienced hunter is uh, $5,000 MSRP. So if any of you all hunt, please go to this website, buy a box of non-lead ammo, go to this website and uh, win some cool gear. And again, the entry is just one box of non-lead ammunition and that's gonna be nonleadeducation.com. We also, you know, we worked with a survey firm. We reached out to the public and we said, you know, what are some of the barriers that are preventing you from using non-lead ammunition? And for the top reasons for folks is the perceptions of performance of non-lead ammunition. They're worried about the ability of non-lead ammo to quickly and efficiently kill the target. And they're worried about the accuracy. Again, a lot of people have been using lead bullets their entire life. Their parents use them, their grandparents use them. People like to hunt with a bullet that they trust. However, these are just perceptions of performance. We know non-lead ammunition works just as well. So we do a lot of outreach. We have booths at all the local sportsman shows. We actually shoot into those ballistic gels and we do demonstrations. We'll shoot lead and non-lead bullets and compare the gels side by side. We'll say, hey, you know, these wound channels are doing the same thing. There's just a lot of lead in one of these gels and there's nothing in the other one. We also do ammunition testing. We'll take out a bunch of non-lead ammunition to a range and we'll let folks try, try it out and see what shoots better out of their rifle. Try to minimize some of that overhead cost for switching to uh, non-lead ammunition. So these are all just ways that uh, we can keep the, the hunting community um, leading from the front on conservation as they, they have in the past. And with that, I've got uh, my email address up here. There is truly so much to this topic. We could talk about this for several more hours. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. I've also got my boss's email address up there. One of us will definitely get back to you. And then I've got our incentive uh, program website up there. Again, if anyone hunts or knows someone who does, please enter. Um, it's a great chance to win some gear. And uh, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Kenzie. For overall questions. All right, those are some amazing presentations. Thank you all so much for taking the time to put these together. We'll be now entering the Q&A portion of the evening. If you haven't already yet, go ahead and enter your questions for our speakers into the question box. We'll do our best to try to get to all of the questions, but some we might not get to and we can do our best to answer later. With that said, we have our first question. All right, first question is for Morgan. And 
Um, our viewers are curious what some of the best places in the gorge are to view bald eagles. So the obvious answer is down at the Dalles Dam. That's why they have Eagle Watch held each year in January. I believe Eagle Watch is the, I think it's the 20th this year. Uh, but Eagle Watch is a Saturday event that's held at the Dalles Dam Visitor Center from around 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. off the top of my head in addition to it being put on by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It also has in attendance myself. I will be bringing a touch table with bird feathers as well as replica bones and replica eggs for people to examine. But more importantly, the U.S. Forestry Service as well as the Dalles Dam employees, they bring out a whole bunch of spotting scopes and they point them right at the eagles. Uh, if you can't come out during Eagle Watch, well, don't worry. The Dallas Dam Visitor Center has a nice big parking lot, and feel free to come on down when it does suit your schedule. In addition to that, my personal favorite spot to look for bald eagles is when I'm on I-84, when I'm westbound, and I'm passing by Mosier just before exit 69, there's a nice tree. It's on the Columbia side. Usually there's an eagle there. Awesome. Thank you, Morgan. Um, next question is for Hannah. And our viewer wants to know, do copper bullets still pose hazards to environmental features such as waterways if they get into the system? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, yeah, in general, actually, both lead and copper are pretty stable overall, so long as the pH is not changing too much. Um, yeah. Awesome. Next question is for Sean. Um, where is the Altamont Pass, and what do you what do you mean when you say repowering? Uh, I should have mentioned where the Altamont Pass is. It's a uh, it's in California, east of the uh, Bay Area, uh, right on the edge of the valley. So it's a low pass between the valley, the Central Valley, and the Bay. And repowering is refers to the replacement of the first generation turbines with modern wind turbines. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next question. I think this is pretty much directed to Morgan, but 21 year old, 21 years old sounds old. What's the longest known bald eagle lifespan? So 21 sounds quite old. In the wild, we would expect a bald eagle, if it survives its first few years, to live in the wild of about 20 to 25 years. In captivity, we expect a bald eagle to live through its 40s. I believe. Uh, the American Eagle Foundation down in Kodiak, Tennessee. I believe they have a bald eagle uh, about 50 years old by the name of Challenger. And I was looking it up recently. I believe the world record for a golden eagle in captivity was 62 years of age. Awesome. Next question is for Sean. And it's, do turbines disturb the thermals eagle soar in? It's a good question. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I'll point out that, you know, well, where I work, I mean, it's a complex wind terrain environment. So there is soaring, but there's, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the, um, there's also, I would say there's a lot more gliding and other kinds of behaviors than soaring where I work. But I would think that, um, I mean, wind turbines do add a lot more turbulence to the, uh, to the aerosphere. All right, next question is for Hannah. Is there a difference in cost between lead and non-lead bullets? Yeah, so that uh, used to definitely be true pretty much across the board. It hasn't really been true in that same sense since around like 2016. And actually COVID just changed the prices of everything as I'm, I'm sure we've all noticed. Um, it depends on the caliber you're shooting as well. Um, they're priced similarly to premium bonded lead bullets, but in general, the price of uh, traditionally pretty cheap cup and corp lead bullets have really increased as well. Um, so my answer is it, it depends on your caliber and it depends on what you're used to shooting, but uh, I will, yeah, not, not significantly at this point. 
All right, next question is for Morgan. What is the budget that you guys are looking for when updating the enclosures for your eagles? Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about what you guys want to improve? So we have actually been wanting to make some, we, we always make our own little improvements throughout the year. We replace a perch here. We bring in some fresh material there. So we're constantly trying to update, improve things. But what we currently have is we're looking to redo the whole complex altogether, completely tear down, rebuild the entire space they inhabit. Uh, because when the facility was originally constructed back in 2007, 2008, it was a slightly different era. As um, some people that I look up to in the raptor world would describe it, 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 we're in the middle of a raptor revolution where we're really rethinking how we take care of these animals in captivity. But we are also in the middle of a climate changing uh, wildfires continue to be on the increase here in Oregon, and we've gone from an era of, oh, there, there's a fire, it's kind of big, to days in a row of heavy wildfire smoke. Uh, just how it was mentioned earlier, lead is bad for birds, lead is bad for us. Well, wildfire smoke is also bad for them the same way it's bad for us. In fact, wildfire smoke is even worse for birds than us. Uh, the old saying, the canary in the coal mine, that was because that poor canary was inhaling those um, noxious fumes and would perish, giving the miners enough time to escape from that invisible gas leak. Uh, we don't want any bald eagles in the wildfire smoke. Uh, so one of our big goals is establishing a indoor space where it's not simply a climate we're controlling, we're going to have an HVAC system, we're going to have filtered air, we're going to have all those nice things that I don't even have. I grew up over in North Portland, I never had AC. You just kind of suffered. But as the caretaker of these animals, uh, I, I can tell my partner, I can tell my siblings, I can tell all the other humans, I can say, put on a sweater, I can say suffer. I can't do that to these animals I'm looking after. I don't want to betray them that way. So I I want everyone else to suffer by giving me all of your money so that way we can fund this very extravagant project. Uh, I can't remember the exact amount of funding we're looking to get. I believe it was about a hundred thousand to completely rebuild this structure again indoor plumbing electricity hvac system uh if we can reach for the sky we're gonna grab the stars out of it awesome thank you uh, next question is for hannah do you know any information about lead poisoning coming from lead fishing weights and fish eating birds is that something that's been researched at all yeah, there has been a lot of research on that. To be honest, that's not something I personally know as much about. Um, so yeah, I would I would direct you to some other resources out there. An organization called Sporting Lead Free uh, tends to focus on fishing and uh, hunting. Um, and I just, I don't want to give you any information that's not spot on. Next question is for Sean. How do wind turbine caused eagle fatalities compare to deaths due to climate change and fossil fuel pollution? <laughs> well, I don't know because I have no data on eagle deaths from fossil fuel pollution or from climate change. I do have data from wind turbines. That's all I know. All right. Next question is, how can our viewers as advocates on a policy level or otherwise to help with these issues that you all three have talked about tonight? I mean, I kind of addressed some of the policy issues in, in my talk, and uh, I would say a lot of folks just don't know about non-lead ammunition. They don't even, they don't know it's an option. They don't know things that, um, like you can buy ammunition online. A lot of people aren't used to doing that. It makes it a lot easier to find what you're looking for. So just taking what you've learned here and, and telling the hunters in your life, or if you're a hunter using that non-lead ammo, that, that would be the best way to do it on my end.
Was that was that a question for all three of us? And yeah. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. Um, how can our viewers as advocates help you guys with the issues you're working on? So for you, like reducing mortalities from raptors oh. on a policy level. I guess I, I'm not understanding the first part of the question. How are the viewers? What can the viewers do to help? Yeah, what can our viewers do to help out? Good, good question. Well, be aware um, that uh, I just want the re our viewers to be aware that you know we have gone down this path, like we've done so many other times with the uh, emergence of technology, something new to our culture, our society, our economy, and we have taken it and just put it out there in a in a rapid speed. We have the the exponent the um proliferation of wind energy in the United States is super exponential, beyond exponential. It's going way, it's gone way beyond the science. We can't keep up with what's happening. So I'm afraid that the impacts are going to be um, out of our reach and probably already are. We're looking at a major reduction, possible loss of our largest raptors in North America. In fact, I think red tailed hawk is well on its way. I mean, people think it's a common animal, and it, it, it is, relatively speaking, but the numbers, the mortality coming out of wind projects is just beyond belief. It's not going to be sustainable. We're going to lose them. Right now in California, we're losing our burrowing owls. They also were getting killed by wind turbines at a rapid rate. Very many burrowing owls getting killed in the Altamont Pass. Now we, we're losing burrowing owls at a rapid pace. So they're gone from my community. They're, they're gone from Davis in Yellow County. They're, they're, out, they're extirpated. In the last three years, they're, they're gone. And it's spreading throughout California. I just want the viewers to be aware of what's happening. And we need to act to um, slow some of the stuff down. We need to uh, allow scientists to catch up with how to manage the situation, not just with wind, but with solar as well. I'm not talking about rooftop, I'm talking about utility scale solar, very devastating impacts to wildlife. That's why I want the viewers to take from here. Morgan, do you have anything to add? Uh, I would agree that simply being aware of what is going on in your own community is very important. Uh, there's only so much that you learn when you're going through grade school. There's only so much that you learn when you take a a major in college. There's only so much continuing education you engage with throughout your adulthood. And you kind of need to pick and choose what you want to care about. Uh, since I've chosen to focus on wildlife sciences, I try to be aware of what's going on with that. But occasionally things slip through the cracks. I was aware with the avian influenza outbreaks of the last couple of years and that impact it was having on our wildlife, but I was uh, rather surprised to learn about the impact that avian influenza was having on wild crow populations across North America. And I don't really wanna end on a, a sad note, but I believe it was something about 25% of all wild crows were wiped out in the past two years because of it. Uh, so it very much is a, a pick and choose, but it's also important to not let that sadness uh, overwhelm you, to not succumb to helplessness. If you find injured animals, do what you can to help them. And in the case of what one person asked uh, for out here in the gorge, uh, that would be contacting our Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, Rowena Wildlife Clinic. But if you don't live in the gorge, maybe you're over in Pendleton, you have the Blue Mountain Wildlife. Well, well, if you're over in Portland, there's Audubon Society, as well as Dove Lewis that can help with after hours. If you're further south still, there's Turtle Ridge, there's Chintimity Wildlife, there's Cascade Raptor Center. There are so many wildlife rehabilitation centers throughout Oregon. You're never further than an hour and a half's drive if you have an injured animal. But it's not the same for all states. So if you happen to be watching from Washington, please support your wildlife rehabilitation centers because sometimes the closest one to you is here in Oregon. And there are rules when it comes to taking animals across state lines. If you find an injured possum, you can't bring it from Washington down to Oregon. That's a uh, that's a crime, unfortunately. So be aware of the rules and the regulations and do pick a couple topics to care about, to follow, to be interested in, and to talk with your friends and family to let them know about that 
cool thing you saw recently or this one fact that's really nagging at you. Awesome. All right, guys, we have one time for one more question this evening. And our last question is going to be to all three of you. Um, as biologists, what advice would you give to individuals interested in supporting bald eagle conservation or pursuing a career in wildlife rehabilitation and research? I would say the very first step is to, again, start by volunteering at a local wildlife rehabilitation center, because this is how you're going to figure out, do you have the guts to do this job? Um, it's like being a veterinarian. How many young children decided they wanted to be a veterinarian to help the kittens and the puppies and the cats and the dogs? And then you found out that sometimes you have to do the bad things too. So when you take that time to volunteer, you can really figure out can I get a knuckle deep in a rat as I'm cutting it up to feed an injured bald eagle patient? Uh, how many mice am I comfortable touching each day? Uh, can you handle the stink? Because thawing out rats, that is a funk. It takes time to get used to that scent. We don't often think about our noses, but our noses do so much for us. Um, but if you find that you do have the, the stomach to remove stomachs, then I would consider, uh, again, participating in more hands-on activities. Maybe you opt to pursue a degree in wildlife sciences or maybe a degree in animal sciences, a degree in veterinary science. You don't necessarily need to commit to being a full-on certified veterinarian, but maybe you find happiness and joy simply being a technician and being that assistant with slightly fewer bills to pay from the education it takes. And Sean and Hannah, do you guys have any advice for people wanting to pursue careers in wildlife research or education or just supporting bald eagle conservation? Uh, I found it really useful to work on a lot of different projects. Um, there's a, a job website that Texas A&M posts where they, uh, or the hosts, excuse me, where a lot of different organizations will post jobs they have. Uh, similar to what Morgan was saying, this gives you the chance to work on different things, figure out what you like, what kind of ecosystems you enjoy working with or spending time in. And um, yeah, that, that would be my main recommendation. As far as uh, the raptor rehabilitation uh, goes, from my end, all I can speak to is, you know, keep using non-lead ammo. I had a mentor when I was young in my career who uh, told me and others that if you're going to go in this career path, you need to maintain a good sense of humor or you'll never survive. Also, don't expect to win every time, all your battles. Um, you can't change the world all by yourself. Just be happy with the small victories, which I am. I'm always happy with the small victories. On the rehab stuff, I would suggest to you, I mean, you saw from my photo, my, my presentation, there were some eagles that were still alive. I had a little note at the bottom right of each one, euthanized. They're always euthanized. In fact, I went and interviewed rehabbers in my area, asking them why all our birds and bats that we bring to them from the Altamont Pass, wind turbines, are all euthanized. I got the answer, and the answer was the budget is terrible, and state law required them to either find a place for the birds or bats or whatever they are within six months, or you euthanize them. That's the state law. So they don't want to get used to the animals. You know, it's just too pre depressing for their um, staff to get used to the animals over six months and they have to euthanize them. And they don't have the budget to keep them anyway. So they euthanize them right away. That's just a pragmatic decision. And it's terrible. So anybody who wants to help out, do what I do. Donate money to rehab rehabbers, wildlife rehabbers. It goes a long ways. All right, everyone, thank you for watching and participating with us. Those were some awesome questions and a great webinar getting to know more about Eagles in the Gorge. Before you go, I want to let you know that this webinar is a glimpse of many that we are going to host throughout the upcoming year. If you enjoyed this webinar, consider donating to friends by scanning the QR code to help fund our work. Your support means so much to us. We hope to see you at our next webinar in April. Keep an eye out for emails and social media posts to learn more about future webinars and upcoming Eagle outings in the Gorge. A reminder that a recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube page tomorrow. Thank you all so, so much for being here tonight. Have a great night and a happy new year.